Hello and welcome to Student Affairs Live. I'm your host Tony Duty, and I'm pleased to be joining you from my professional home at Rutgers University. We broadcast on the Higher Ed Live Network and you can tune in to Student Affairs Live along with my brilliant friend and co-host Heather Shea Gasser Wednesdays at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. If you're unfamiliar with past episodes, I highly recommend you check out and favor the archive link that we're tweeting out now. We're proud to have covered over 100 topics over the last year and a half with more than 200 of the very top practitioners, scholars, and experts in the field. In a moment, I'll introduce you to our guests, but we can't do that without first giving a shout out to the sponsors that make Student Affairs Live possible. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing communication firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. M. Stoner is offering a free webinar on April 28th on the anatomy of a story. Registration is free and we're tweeting out a link shortly that you can sign up. Higher Ed Live is also sponsored by ACPA, College Student Educators International. Visit myacpa.org to discover the new way to engage or new ways to engage with your personal and professional development. And I want to take a moment to thank Kate Zulo and Carrie Locke who are here in the studio with me right now. Uh, they have, uh, they'll be monitoring the Twitterverse here today and answering any questions that you met, might have and, and retweeting your best content from the Twitterverse. I want to remind everyone that these episodes are designed to be interactive. Your engagement through your questions and comments on Twitter really improves the quality of today's conversation. So finally, I'm honored to have Peter Lake on today's episode. You can read his full biography on the episode page. Peter, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us today. Could you start us off by briefly describing your background and what led you to pursue the field of law? Great. Hey, Tony, thanks for having me today. This is a real treat, and hi to everybody out there that can see me. Um, how I got into law, you know, I, I went to college wanting to be a lawyer and ended up realizing I really wanted to become a professor and ultimately a professor of law. I didn't really enter the field thinking I'd do higher education law and policy. Uh, a colleague of mine who many people out there know, Bob Bickle, came in. He said, you should do higher ed stuff. And I didn't entirely see what he saw, but one thing led to another. And back in the 1990s, we started writing pieces on college safety. It became a book. Several books followed. And one thing led to another, and I've become something of a, a focus area on higher education law and policy, you might say. So. That's that's me in a nutshell. Cool. So I I, I read in in your re recent book um, that law English is more challenging to learn than many foreign languages, and that we almost need a Rosetta Stone to understand the legalese, legal speak. Now, having read my share of court cases, I I would certainly not disagree. <laughs> and a remedy that you suggest is improved communication. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that and some, maybe suggest some practical strategies for our viewers? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things I noticed that law English does is it uses familiar terms in unfamiliar ways, and it lures people into thinking that the meaning that they have taken away from a term is what the courts meant, but in fact, the meaning is slightly different. And so what I do a lot in my trainings and work is I try to identify the key terms so that people can become law fluent or at least law literate. Uh, and, and basic levels. It's, it really is not helpful to most people to try to learn all of law English, but it is necessary to learn key terms. So I'll give you an example. I, I do a lot of Title IX work, and the term sexual harassment has meanings across multiple cultural dimensions. It has a very, very specific meaning in the culture of law. So I will take my trainees and I'll show them this is exactly what the Department of Education says sexual harassment is. And when you may be tempted to think it means other things, but you have to realize this is what they think it means. And I, what it, it reminds me of, we do a lot of travel into the Caribbean from Florida. I'm in sunny Florida right now, and we often jump on a boat to go. And I, I run into a lot of patois in the Caribbean, where English is part of the language system, but it's not the primary language. And you think you know what you're saying, but in fact, you're using a word in a slightly different way than it has become to be used in that particular vernacular. So I think that's challenging. I mean, when you approach a language you've never spoken before, you start from the basics. But when you come to a language system that you have familiarity with, there's a tendency to impute meaning to that word based sure. on your prior experience. And that's where people get tripped up. Great. So I, I, I will admit I am regularly overwhelmed and I know that I'm not 
alone on this, by the sheer volume and rate of change surrounding legal issues, lawsuits, regulations, legislative policies, how, how are we as practitioners supposed to keep up and make sense of it all? Is, is there a website, a newsletter, a tool, some, something practical that you can re recommend to the viewers? What's happened, Tony, is that the, the learning facilities are having trouble keeping pace with the rate of change. And as you know, higher education is a business that changes very slowly. Um, uh, who was it that said that changing a curriculum is like moving a cemetery? <laughs> and it has that sort of challenge associated with it. So you know, if you work in a higher ed, you, know, you could spend all year debating a policy change. And, and to bring a new curriculum together takes unbelievable forces to come tectonically together for, to make that happen. Um, so what people are doing is they're patching together things. Some people think, I need to go to law school, which is probably overkill because a law degree is very expensive and wants you to practice law, and that, that might not be where you want to go. And frankly, a lot of what you learn in law school you wouldn't need for higher ed. You could get away with a lot less. You could try to look for a law and policy master's program, and you won't really find one. Uh, even though I've been crowing about this for years and saying that colleges should be teaching, universities should be teaching law and higher education policy as a master's focus, we still don't really have that. And that's just an obvious thing I think that will eventually come online. People pick up continuing ed in a variety of ways. And they do it, for example, at my conference at Stetson in February, the law and policy conference that we do every February in Florida. And that's a way to gain continuing ed knowledge, and a lot of folks come out for that. Those things are kind of expensive, and you have to make a commitment to leave work for three to five days to come to something like that. Um, some of the CE providers are not particularly good, and people have quality issues. I always urge people to crowd around their brand. And so with ACPA, for example, ACPA offers really good programming. So you can get CE knowledge through about law through ACPA. And I think what you're going to be seeing develop very quickly, Tony, is the idea that people need badges and knowledge and skill bases that are very specific, that platform off each other. They really need a new curriculum of instruction, even a new delivery model perhaps to do that. And I would say that that's something over the next five years you're going to see a rapid expansion in that kind of training and teaching. But right now we're all in over our heads and just for the benefit of the audience who's not lawyers, the lawyers are in over their heads too. A lot of the training that we got in law school did not prepare us for this. Uh, working, for example, with the softer side of Sears, the OCR guidance documents and resolution agreements, most of us didn't touch those in law school. And unless you had a unique pathway in litigation or regulatory work, you probably didn't see a lot of it. So we're all swimming in the deep end of the pool holding the anvil. The lawyers and their clients are in this entirely new universe where compliance university has taken over and the universe is expanding and is as dynamic as it's ever been, maybe at any time in American higher education history. Great. So, so when I was researching you, I, I saw somewhere um, that your one of your labels is a futurist on on higher ed policy. So I'm going to ask you about the future right now. What, do, what, do, 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 do. <laughs> Ooh, what's in the future? Yeah, right. you know, I I pride myself on trying to look forward. I think it's been part of the brand at Stetson for a long time. Is not just to present the law as it is, but what's coming around the corner. And that's challenging because until things operationalize, people sometimes don't anticipate what's going to occur and they don't understand what they're seeing. But when I look into the future, there's one clear trend in the short term, probably the long term as well, is that we are now entering the most highly regulated higher education environment in American history. And it's rapidly expanding into the states and at a federal level. I don't see a whole lot to slow that down. I see some forces in Congress attempting to put the brakes on, but I think the train has left the station. And this is a culture change of the first order, not the least of which is being regulated is not familiar to a lot of operatives in higher ed, particularly professors and those that do instructional design. And then the federal government is playing a massive role in the redesign of higher education, which is somewhat ironic because the founding fathers really hesitated on the idea of central federal control. So we're looking at a future where we have, I think, phenomenal constitutional issues on the horizon. 
And we also have a legal system that wants to become part and parcel of the higher education process. And we're legalizing education for better or worse. I have some trepidation about that, but I don't think I can stop the train. It's already left for Hogwarts, platform nine and three quarters. Is already <laughs> in. So we're on our way. Great. So I often get confused when trying to navigate the, the Clery Act, Title IX, and, and FERPA. And again, I, I don't think I'm alone uh, in that confusion. So when faced with incidents, I, I'm always challenged by the questions of, do I share? Who do I share it with? At what point do I share? Can you speak briefly to the purpose of, of each of these acts and regulations and to the tensions that occur in trying to satisfy them all? Yeah, and part of the problem, Tony, is that the United States does not have a single coherent safety mandate at a federal level. Instead, we have a patchwork quilt of laws, many of which weren't even really designed with safety in mind in the first place. Now, clearly was, but uh, Title IX primarily was designed for types of harassment that weren't oriented around physical violence. It's evolved into that, but it really didn't start with a primary focus on that particular issue. Uh, FERPA was a records access and correction statute. I don't think uh, when it was passed in the 70s that anybody could have imagined Virginia Tech or some of the other kinds of siloing issues and safety that would come down the road. So what we're dealing with is, you know, this is not a Boeing 747 a coherently designed airplane to take you on long distances safely from one place to another. Um, it's Even the Wright brothers would be suspicious of jumping on this thing because it's clearly balsa wood, paper clips, and a whole lot of barnstorming that's going in. We're retrofitting things to make them work, and what we're seeing is as we try to put these laws together, they don't always fit well. Uh, OCR has helped us with some of it, but I tell my folks all the time that you will reach places of pure incoherence with some of these rules. They simply don't line up with each other. It's not you. It's not somehow that you don't understand it. The law just doesn't make sense. And for non-legally trained people to look into the abyss and realize it's looking back at you and to see the big empty that sometimes is there is very disturbing. But it's actually a natural feature of laws that expands into new areas of operation. And we're more trained to be familiar with it as lawyers than non-lawyers are, but it's still a little disconcerting when you realize that the very thing that you're being told to do with one federal mandate is exactly the opposite of something somewhere else. And so what do you do? And you pray that someone fixes it at a federal level is what we often do. So, so what stakeholders on campus should be getting trained in these areas? And, and can you offer up some sources of training? Yeah, and I think everybody has a role to play in Compliance University. The most important thing is to realize what your role is and what knowledge and skill base is essential to do your job and then to move up to the next job in the chain of command. Uh, I'm a big fan of the idea that in Compliance U, people should be trained up and down one job, much the way they are in the military, because what we're seeing is a lot of transition. So. For example, let's say your Title IX coordinator leaves for another job. You need to have somebody seamlessly be able to move in and take that responsibility. There's no time to take six months or a year to retrain. You've got to be ready to go right then and there. I think what I find is because people aren't clear what exactly their position on the field is, they tend to undertrain and overtrain. And sometimes they just give up. But a lot of times they gain a lot of training that they really don't need but then they aren't getting the training they actually do need and they aren't always guided by their managers and superiors to exactly the level of training that's appropriate for them. Uh, take resident assistants, for example, non-professional housing staff. I I'm not going to make Title IX experts out of most of those folks. I Maybe one in a hundred will go on to become an investigator or a Title IX person, but I can teach them the basic functioning knowledge of federal mandates so they can do their job effectively and help me do mine as a Title IX coordinator effectively as well. It's a new mindset, but it takes strategic guidance from the top. So I have become a huge fan of enterprise risk management in higher education. ERM uh, is often how it's styled. I was blessed at Stetson when I was Title IX coordinator to have an excellent ERM person at this main campus. It just makes life so much easier because you can have that strategic vision on who plays what position on the field. But it is I think the fundamental challenge in Compliance University is getting a sense of what do I need to know, what don't I really need to know, and if I'm looking to advance my career, where should I be building forward to move up 
and more responsible work. Yeah, I can imagine the continuity issue being being a problem, particularly at smaller institutions, right, that don't have layers um, and layers um, to deal with the issue. So, so in in these areas in particular, Clery Act, Title IX, and, and FERPA, are there any trends that are emerging specifically in those in these areas? Well, I think a couple of major things are going on. Obviously, Title IX has been expanding faster than the known universe, and here it is April, which is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and we always get major federal guidance in April, and usually towards the end of the month. So we're just sitting and waiting to see what comes this time. I would imagine we're going to get something substantial, because we usually do. So the job is constantly changing and expanding. It's every day is a new day in Title IX. The Clery Act, I think, is going through a conceptual reformation. It started as a campus crime reporting bill. And this is what the Clery family wanted, was more perlicidity on campus crime. And they got that. I think what they achieved is people are more aware of criminal danger on campus than they ever were before. And I think the federal mandate succeeded on a strategic level, even if tactically people might not be reading the reports every time they come out. But what we're seeing now is the need to have a more coherent system of safety regulation on campus. And if you notice what's been happening to Clery, it's sort of the omnibus safety bill. We tack things onto it. So we now have timely and emergency warnings. Even VAWA SAVE, when it was passed, was tacked onto Clery, as opposed to Title IX, where it might seem to be more conceptually related. Um, but it was definitely thrown in with, with Clery. So what we're seeing is Clery is mutating. It's moving from a reporting bill to becoming the place that we put student safety law in the United States. Yet, it still is waiting for what I would call a coherent single mandate. It's still bits and pieces, not one coherent system like you have in K-12. Uh, FERPA has been really interesting because in many ways it is beginning to outlive its generation. It was born in the 70s. It's the Registrar's Relief Act because we didn't have quality registrar systems everywhere in America until the federal government said, keep student records in a professional way. And hence, ACREO is born, and we have the registrar culture. But today, many people on campus are managing student records who are not registrars, mm -hmm. and it's moved substantially away from the registrar having the pure hegemony over student records. Uh, Title IX, for example, is a huge student records keeper. I mean, it's a major area of operation, which really didn't exist the way it did until just recently. The other feature is, I think the privacy provisions of FERPA are under a lot of stress uh, because we're starting to realize that students and families want to know more. They don't want the block. They didn't, it wasn't their generation that wanted this sort of thing. And then we're seeing the problems that are associated when we don't share information. Employees and students in particular who move from one environment to another and we don't know the dangers associated with that. So I think in some ways we're looking at re-clarifying, re maybe even fundamentally revisiting all of these federal mandates. They're so 70s, they should be wearing polyester suits. And <laughs> it's kind of retro, but it isn't really working unless you give it a little modern touch. I'm going to do a short clip show of, of your uh, one-liners. I, I can't help myself. Law is so boring, Tony. Then unless you put a little fun in it, I, I can't I can't pay attention to it. So I always feel bad for people that uh, that do. Um, I, I I cut you off. Did you have anything else on on trends? Uh, maybe Title Nine. Hey, well, I, I think the the big trend areas actually to me are student safety, which will continue to grow. I think the idea that students have a basic civil right to safety on campus is emerging. It was left behind in the 60s and 70s, but it's it's becoming clearer now that the consumers of higher education want assurances of basic safety on campus. So I think that will continue. I see a lot of energy around governance issues, how we manage um, going forward will be there. And then I also think there will be tremendous energy around responsible core mission delivery, instructional design and delivery, pedagogy and assessment. Um, and of course, the one that has resurfaced recently is First Amendment. Uh, free speech, protest, et cetera. So I think those four areas, who's in charge, how safe is college campus, are we getting what we really are paying for because it's costing more than ever, and when and how should we speak out and what are the consequences, 
the Oklahoma scenario comes to mind, uh, I think are, are very prominent in people's minds right now and will be. So you brought up academic speech, so I, so I want to go there for, for a few minutes. Universities are increasingly having to deal with campus protests and challenges, uh, and particularly advanced by free speech groups and advocates. So what are some of the legal principles and issues that we should consider when we're creating policies, particularly for public forums and speech? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because the Supreme Court, particularly under Roberts, has been very clear about creating the rules of the First Amendment. It, this has been a very deliberate court on free speech and has really taught us how to play Quidditch, but most people aren't paying attention to that. They aren't reading the playbook, and they're not taking the advice that the Supreme Court is offering on how the game could be played effectively, fairly, and legally. And as a result, I think what we need more than anything else, even more than policy, is we need basic civic education. Um, I think a lot of American students have no idea what their First Amendment rights are, how to exercise them, what has historically been effective in the exercise of First Amendment rights. I mean, there are some people that do, but I see broad swaths of people coming through our business who have strongly held opinions about free speech that are just flatly inconsistent with Supreme Court mandate, or they aren't seeing the opportunities that, that lie there. Um, I'll give you an example, Tony. We went to a campus that was having trouble with students communicating with each other. So they opened up one big chat room, basically. And I walked on campus and I thought, geez, you're really smart people, but if all you open up on campus is a Wild West saloon, what you're going to get is people picking on Miss Kitty and treating Festus the wrong way and shootouts and spitting on the floor, which is exactly what they got. You can create a more textured universe. The Supreme Court actually has told us how to create fora to give them intentionality and articulation and to create really vibrant spaces of human communication. And I would grade most American institutions on that somewhere in the C, low B range at best in terms of using what's available to them. So there, I think we need a cultural reformation in education and, and realize that we're teaching people science and math and philosophy really well, but then they graduate college and go through it and they don't even know what the First Amendment really says. Um, and I'm not shooting for knowledge on the 11th Amendment, which no one understands, but the First Amendment, there's some pretty clear mandates that have been written across the stars by the Supreme Court. So for, from a practical advice uh, perspective, you know, as we look to, to refine or, or take a look back at our, at our policies on, on these public forum spaces, you know, how do we balance time, place, manner? Like, particularly in a public institution, is it okay for a student to to have a protest in front of a classroom? Like, how, how do we deal with issues like that? What are the legal... Well, I, think it's, I, I think it's very situational, and I think the worst way to address it is once you've had the protest and try to backform what you should have done from that, you'll find that when you do First Amendment work driving backwards, you'll crash just about every time. You've got to imagine what's going to happen in the future, drive forward, and you'll do better. And so here's the thing. I mean, some protests in front of classrooms would be material disruptions of an educational environment. Supreme Court said no one's entitled to do that. So we can run our college campus orderly and still have free speech. But if all you've given people is an area to speak that's a swamp off at the corner of the campus, then you can full well expect that they're going to tromp out of the swamp and stand right in front of the administration building and scream and shout. It's very predictable. If you don't make space for speech, vibrant, genuine speech, it will come to you in places that you are uncomfortable and in ways that you're not. And I think a lot of the pressure that we're seeing is people just weren't paying attention. I mean, I wasn't actually surprised at Black Lives Matter when it became so prominent on campuses. It didn't surprise me at all. I think a lot of people weren't listening. And then when I've seen some of the responses to protests, I'm not terribly surprised at some of the responses because people weren't terribly well prepared. Um, you know, I'll take you to UC Davis where they pepper sprayed civil protesters who were peacefully demonstrating. And, you know, you, you, of course you have to ask, which the report did ask, is why are you sending full riot gear police in with pepper spray to manage this? And, well, you know, if you think ahead a little bit and plan ahead, you don't have to respond that way. There are, there are ways to do it better um, if you go into a particular incident. So 
the First Amendment is definitely a go to the gym standard. You, you've got to work your First Amendment muscles. You have to make a commitment to do it. I, of course, am a complete hypocrite for using that analogy, but I'll do it anyway because I'm not, obviously not that good at it. Uh, but you do have to get in and work it. You can't just react to it. And the people who work the First Amendment rules are the ones that generally would be most successful getting their ideas across if they know how to do it. So I'm going to ask you a, a pretty specific question. I was having a conversation with someone this morning um, about First Amendment rights. And, you know, back, back in the day, the whole campus used to be fly, covered with flyers at every location. And the, then universities came in and said, no, you can only put your flyers here. Like, how, how does that hold up under legal scrutiny? Well, again, it, it, here's the classic lawyer answer. You know, it depends. Uh, but what it really depends on is you've got to create space for people to speak publicly. You don't have to let people turn your entire environment into a circus or reduce it to an entirely open public forum. I think that's a huge mistake, by the way. I don't think there's any reason why the whole campus should be considered a traditional public forum or designated public forum. I, I can't even imagine how you'd run a campus like that if you had that mentality. But on the other hand, if you go too far the other direction and it's you, you know, you can only post something of six words on this little whiteboard that's down the hall in the residence facility that nobody lives in, it's not going to work. You've got to give people the space. Now, the Supreme Court has yet to rule directly on speech zone cases, and I know a lot of people have thoughts out there, but I, I've got to say, having seen some of the cases that they might look at, it wouldn't be hard for me to imagine that a supermajority of the court might tell campuses to not do that, not to relegate speech to a ghetto or to eliminate the possibility of open dialogue in an institution that is otherwise theoretically dedicated to that. Um, I also think, Tony, we need to look in the mirror and realize that now a lot of baby boomers run college campuses and we were the people in the streets in the 60s. Well, I wasn't. I was just a little tight, but I kind of missed the summer of love. I was only 10 years old. Um, but people were jumping in the streets for free speech and free protest. And now that we're in charge, our first instinct sometimes is to tell people to stop doing it. Right. And that, uh, I, I wouldn't go so far to say hypocrisy, but it's evident to the young people and even to the court. Um, the case I always draw people's attention to is out of New Hampshire, where the state of New Hampshire, with no hint of irony, uh, tried to prosecute somebody who refused to put on his license plate, live free or die. And that case actually went all the way to the Supreme Court. And I, I guess the state of New Hampshire just didn't have a mirror because if you really could live free or die, I suppose that would mean that you'd have the right to say, hey, I, maybe I'll choose an alternative. I'll take a little less freedom and, and survive. And of course, they lost the case. And the Supreme Court thought, you're obviously not listening to yourself. Um, you're projecting one value, but not really standing on it. So I could go on and on, Tony. I love it. Great. So uh, another area that, that gets a little gets raised often in student affairs is the issue of due process and in particular around areas of student conduct. So again, what are some good practices in the development of student conduct codes, policies, procedures, and, and how often should we be looking at these? Wow, I mean, that. so we'll have another two-hour show on that. <laughs> I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. You probably know that I was a discipline officer at my school for almost 10 years and then became Title IX coordinator for a period of time. So I've had my hand in discipline. I've even written a book on discipline. And I've had this deep-seated concern that we've looked to the law to tell us what due process is without listening to the law, which is telling us the due process is the process that's due for your environment. And there's been, in my opinion, a certain amount of poverty of imagination about what educational due process looks like in the higher ed context. And, and by no means am I anti-due process. I believe in it. I actually am a champion of it. I just think we're underutilizing it. I think we're listening to lawyers. So what we're getting is a generation, which started really back in the 70s, of discipline systems and Title IX systems that are lawyers, codes, legalistic procedures, legal terms. We even have an association, which I'm a huge fan of, um, that is entirely devoted to being legalists, people who aren't practicing law but are using legal ideas in student discipline. And it's become a huge part of our culture to legalize our intervention strategies with students. I've tried to get people to think, you don't necessarily have to do that. 
And I have this funny feeling, and I know some of the scholars in the field and I sharply divide on this. Uh, I think when the Supreme Court finally reaches the issue of due process in higher education, which they really punted away back in the 70s and early 80s, I have a feeling they're going to tell us about the concern that too much legalistic process is actually adverse to the very environment we're trying to use it in, that you can have too much process. I call it super duper poopy doopy process. <laughs> and if you are out there listening to this, when we go to try to simplify our codes, what happens? They get bigger and broader. So we have more rules, more procedures. And codes have this tendency to beget other codes in this Old Testament-like way. So as you do, I do a lot of forensic code work with campuses, and we discover codes all the time. There's a, a code over here and a code over there. And I have to ask, is codeness in our best educational future? Is, is, is that the best thing to do? That's not a facetious question. I think it's one educators need to ask. Because sometimes what gets lost, Tony, is the exercise of judgment and professionalism. And as lawyers come in, they may not know our world as well as we do, and their legal instincts may be sharp, but their educational instincts may be a little off. And I could multiply examples with this, but I'll, I'll stop, because you, you hit a topic you know I like. So you, you mentioned uh, that you were in the Caribbean, and we actually have some international viewers here today. Matthew okay. Stewart Fulton from Ross University School of Medicine in the West Indies is interested in hearing your thoughts on the possible repercussions from some states passing laws that allow lawyers to represent students in student conduct hearings. Yeah, I'll, I'll go right for the, the jugular on this one because a lot of it has been in response to Title IX. There's been a sense that some respondents are not being treated fairly, so let's lawyer up. The federal government approved after lengthy negotiation and the negotiated rulemaking process they approve the idea of a potted plant. So you have to now at least permit someone to sit in the room. They don't have to permit, participate. You can let them participate, but you've at least got to let lawyers in the room. And let's be honest, once the lawyers are in the room, the dynamic changes. The thing that's most interesting to me, Tony, is that I think people assume that if you're lawyered up, you're better off. And my experience in higher education administration has often been exactly the opposite is that when lawyers come in, they actually make it worse for their clients. And so you find yourself in this bizarre position as the administrator of trying to help a student who's been accused of something work through the problems that are associated with being poorly represented. Um, and it shows me that I think people need advocacy on their behalf and support, but I don't know that lawyer advocates are always the most effective thing to do. But I hate to say it is hunker down in the West Indies because the legal hurricane is coming through and lawyers are coming to college campuses like never before. I see the briefcases lining up. And if you look at the national dialogue on Title IX, it has been dominated by lawyers and legally trained people, cops, lawyers, prosecutors, law professors. I mean, it's as if somehow we have some unique insight into managing student populations and that cultural phenomenon is something we should be paying attention to. One of the questions that always comes to mind is why don't we have some a, a standard boilerplate template for student conduct codes? I, you know, I think back to the, the AUP's 1940 statement on academic freedom. What are the distinctions and, and uh, between different kinds of institutions that might affect this kind of universal student conduct uh, policy or template? I think the core issue, Tony, is that nobody wants to stand up to the plate and say, we have the authority to mandate policy language throughout the country universally. And when you look at it, there's competition over that. Um, the American Law Institute's meeting right now to try to devise a model Title IX policy. But I think a lot of people will say, oh, that's great, but who are you? Um, and the federal government doesn't have the regulatory authority to mandate specific boilerplate policies. You might notice that they talked about the UVA Title IX policy as exemplary, but then when you ask them, is this the blueprint, they back off of that because they don't have the authority to actually tell schools. You have to have this complete policy language. Um, I'm seeing it at a state level. I see states now, uh, California is an example of this, where 
at least in the state public system, the leaders are saying, I, we want some coherence at the state level. We're going to insist on at least policy rectification, if not mandated policies. But this is kind of like traveling through Europe. Your hairdryer is likely to blow something up if you cross a boundary. It, the uh, amperage and voltage is just not the same. And there are competing ideas about who should be the person to create these codes and foist them on to everyone else. The result is we have a certain amount of chaos. Um, now, that being said, a hats off to Ed Stoner and Gary Pavella in particular, who I think gave model systems that most everybody in the United States uses as some kind of blueprint for what they work with. And it's nice to see that scholars and lawyers, but scholar lawyers, have played a prominent role in shaping the future of how we think about discipline codes. But I have to say that the power to do this now is shifting to regulators. And in some recent OCR rulings, it's pretty clear that things that we thought were core features of codes that we developed will no longer be survivable under federal guidance. So it's uh, the competition is on, Tony. So I, I'm going to take a step back. I got a, a question from, from Twitter from Seth Avakian. Um, he asks if you can look at and provide maybe some recent court rulings that clarify balancing between freedom of speech and the right to protection from sexual harassment. And, and I'm putting you on the spot here, so if you can't think of any court cases, maybe a, a resource we can direct them to. Well, actually, I, I have a very specific resource um, that I think will be somewhat helpful. The leading Supreme Court decisions on this issue are from the Sugar Ray period, the late 90s. They're out of date. Uh, they were controversial, five to four. Courts changed. I don't know, I don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do when they revisit them. I don't think anybody does. The federal lower courts have been following them pretty religiously. You might want to look at the Doe versus Brown case, uh, DOE versus Brown. It's the judge that decided that case essentially wrote a law review article and summarized a large number of cases that involved the issue of balancing Title IX rights with other rights on campus, including in some cases what you might think of as free speech. Um, some of the issues I think that would really have put it to the test, like the Kipnis controversy, um, have been managed outside, largely outside of court. So we haven't gotten some of the real great snapshots that we would hope to get. But I would look to Doe versus Brown, and that's a good starting place. And it's a long case, but it's an exceptionally well-written case uh, from a sort of an educational perspective. I, I use it just to keep me up to date on everything that went before. And uh, But there have been cases since. But yeah, there are many cases percolating through the federal courts right now. Many of them raise questions that aren't really free speech. They tend to go a little bit more towards due process or fair process, breach of contract but they're not all of that dimension. Some of them have associational issues, free speech, expressive activity as well. Great. Thanks, Thanks for taking that one on. Sure. So, so in another area that I categorize as hard to keep up with, and, and again, this could be in the eight-hour uh, uh, institute, I'm sure, what, what are some of the legal issues related to student affairs that have arisen as a result of technology and, and or social media? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a technology expert, and uh, for everybody out there, uh, uh, Tony had to deal with that before he went live, so God bless his patience. He's still smiling. Uh, I already pushed a couple buttons I shouldn't have pushed. I probably started a war game someplace. <laughs> um, everything that happens in the digital world is essentially equivalent to what's happening in the real world. But I think the reality is, is that we're struggling to make the transposition of the legal rules into that world. And some folks who are not technologically savvy, like myself, tend to just want to look away from that world and deal with the real world, so to speak. But for modern students, the technology universe is their real world. That is where they live. Um, I'm beginning to think humans now are going to become genetically connected to iPhones and Samsungs. It seems like we're all... I'm surprised I could get away from mine for an hour. I'm feeling withdrawal right now. <laughs> So that's where we live and learn, and I think that's what you're seeing is rules that are developing to try to, to manage that. Um, the First Amendment applies in full force there. Uh, Title IX applies there. It all transposes, but it takes special application. My advice is, you know, you need teenagers. You need people that get the digital world to work hand-in-hand -hand with people that are from a different generation, and 
the best thing I think any campus can do is to recruit people who are technologically fluent and literate and employ them in collaborative work at the highest level. Um, our business of student affairs, as you know, has been very rank oriented. You have to earn your way up the ladder. But the reality is we need some foot soldiers in there, people that really get it, that can help us and guide us through the technology universe in a meaningful way. Nice. So how, how do students do that if their institution isn't responding? Um, yeah, I, I find, Tony, that the typical student of today lives in a dual universe. And by day, they work within the structures that we give them in the real world. And then often simultaneously and then often at night, they go into a dual universe where they replicate every activity that we have. And believe me, every single thing that we do on campus, the students have a system that parallels it. And they have some that we don't have. They have systems of justice, pharmaceuticals. I mean, it's not professional and some of it's not right, but it exists. Trying to integrate that, to recognize that the typical modern student will simply work around a system that's dysfunctional as opposed to generally choosing to attack it is one of the things that we have to work with. So that just because they're not complaining doesn't mean they're behaving in a way that we want them to and doesn't mean they're collaborating with us. So inviting collaboration out of respect and trying to break the barriers between the two dual universes I think is the real, real opportunity. I mean, I mean, I see it in class. My students are on their computers. They're tutoring each other right while I'm sitting there. And I can see in some cases when I go into live social media, I can see them acting right while they're sitting in class. And so my class is this big open forum connecting with people who aren't sitting there. People are communicating with each other. It's not all dysfunctional. Some of it is. And so some of the better teachers out there are learning how to integrate that reality and make it part of the classroom as opposed to punishing it or resisting it. Um, you know, the Luddite way of approaching this is to let's all close our computers and take long hand and it's like, yeah, I, I don't think our students are really going to cotton to the idea of bringing back the Abacus and number two pencils. It's just, it, it's charmingly retro, but it's not the solution, I think, in the long run for everything. Although there are times I think we need to put the computers down. I, I would agree. Um, having, having sat in a few classes and, and observing the clicking away, uh, it's obvious that they're not taking notes, folks aren't taking notes, that uh, they are checking their social media. And I actually thought about this uh, some time ago. What, what does a, a staff or faculty member, what options do they have? Is that, could they reasonably say that without having any legal issues? Close your well, computer or let me see what you're working on right now? I mean, if here we go again with the use it or lose it First Amendment stuff, if we intervene without having thought through why we're intervening or articulated it, we'll probably run into problems. Yeah. Um, if we set the tone ahead of time by in our syllabus and even in our orientation process as to what the expectations are, uh, courts generally give us the right to create a fair pedagogical environment on our terms. So we can decide what a classroom looks like. The judges don't want to have to do that. But we have to think it through ahead of time. And I would urge people to look at Harvard University's Press's book from about a year or so ago called Make It Stick. Um, it's written with the help of some professional writers, but by some authors that have done some genuine empirical work on human learning. And I have found the one trick that's really very helpful is to get intermediate learners in the classroom as team teachers. And so I'm using TFs more than ever, and I'm even turning whole class units over to teaching fellows under my guidance. It's, um, it runs against the way I was taught, and I sometimes think I should be the one controlling everything in the classroom, but by bringing intermediaries into the classroom, people closer in learning and time to the learners, what I'm finding is I'm getting incredibly valuable information on how to restructure information, what's actually happening on the digital world, and I just think my students are paying more attention to me and to the class. It's engaging. It's one of the tricks that Make It Stick points out, but I think there's some others in there as well. But at the underlying all of this, Tony, is the fundamental challenge that we still don't really know enough about human higher learning to necessarily construct the classroom experience based on science that guarantees the maximum outputs. Uh, K-12 to got all the learning science over the last 50 years. We didn't. We have bits and pieces. So we're still navigating 
a little bit by our bootstraps, and if science teaches anything, intuition isn't always right. Right. So if you had only an hour to, to work with staff or faculty, say, doing a new student uh, or a new employee orientation program with the opportunity to discuss important legal issues, what, what would you absolutely make sure that you covered? The rule of law. Uh, my, biggest, my biggest concern in this industry right now is respect for the rule of law. And I think that that is an enormous challenge to education. Any, any education or society that loses respect for the rule of law is, does not have much of a chance to go forward. And one of the most basic features of the respect for the rule of law is learning the law and learning how it can be effective. So I see a lot of protesters and people reacting to protests that haven't taken the time to actually read Supreme Court cases or try to learn something from them. They sometimes openly disregard them and treat them like playthings, and that's sad to me when I see that happen. Um, I often tell people, pick up the works of Dr. King. He wasn't a lawyer, but he was as good as any lawyer I've ever seen. The man was brilliant on a lot of different dimensions, and there's so much to learn from the rule of law and the respect for the rule of law. We have a society that's teetering towards violence, disrespect for science, disrespect for law, and our institutions can't become infected with that. Um, so traipsing out facetious legal rules to discipline students shows disrespect for the very thing that we're built on in the first place. And students can do the same thing. They can learn that if I don't like the law, I actually can be empowered to help change it, but I can only do that by respecting it first. And I'm afraid I see disrespect for the rule of law, not outright contempt, but sometimes the kind of casual disrespect but comes from someone who doesn't bother to learn enough about something before they jump in the middle of it. And that, I think, is why we're here, is to broaden the understanding of that. So I, I'm always afraid of teaching people legal rules if I think they're going to use them in a disrespectful or contemptuous way. Um, there's a certain amount of wisdom that comes with the law. It's power. And with power comes responsibility. In the lowest vibration, people use legal principles as tools to oppress others. I've heard dictators say that. You know, for my enemies, I give them law. That's the lowest vibration. But in the highest vibration, the law can be deeply inspiring. And so I, what I ask my staff to do is I say, what is the mission of the legal principle that we are attempting to implement? What, what is it we're here to do? Title IX says reduce or eliminate sex discrimination on campus. So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to let the rules work towards that end and not get worked by the rules and forget why we're here. Why is FERPA here? Because we should have respect for the information that persists about people. Give them access to it and show them respect in who they share it with. That's the principle behind it. Um, even comfort and service animals. I hear a lot of grumbling about that. Um, now we have to have a circus on campus, I hear people say. Well, why are we bringing the animals back? I guess the real question is why did we kick them out in the first place? Humans have learned alongside animals for millennia, and it's only in the last 50 years that we kicked the dogs and cats and horses out. And I don't think we're better off for it. So they're pushing their way back in. And what I always ask people is, where is the highest good in this legal principle? How can we live that with our staff? You don't have to be Justice Roberts on the Supreme Court. Every American has the right to know the law in their heart and act in principle on it. And I believe it's a sacred responsibility in a democracy. And that's why I think more than anything else, if I have 10 minutes or an hour, it's about the rule of law. So I, I would guess that you would have the same um, recommendation if you were doing an orientation program for students. Even more so. Because I've lived in this business long enough now, Tony, that my students are now my administrators. Um, I had a meeting yesterday with a, a woman who's a dean at my law school. She was my student in 1990. I remember telling her, I said, someday you're going to be a dean here, and, and she was. And if she were listening, she'd chuckle right now. It happens faster than you think. Uh, we're all just visitors here, um, prisoners of our own device, I suppose, not to paraphrase Hotel California a little bit, but we're just visiting. We don't really spend a whole lot of time in higher ed, even though we think we will. And even after a long career, you realize just how preciously short it really is. So more than anything else, it's what we pass on to the next generation of people who are coming through what the real lessons are, the meta lessons that we're teaching. And are students today learning that we're afraid of the law, that the law is something we should fight and manipulate? What kind of a legacy is that? 
who will, what, what, what will they inherit from people that are teaching them that? That's what I'm most concerned about. And so I want, I, I would say it even more so to the young people of today, is the law is a magnificent feature of a surviving civilization, and it's a core value in any educational process. When you look at where we went off the farm, when higher ed really failed, every single time, it thumbed its nose at basic fairness and the law. It, it violated the basic principles that we're built on. And the law has sometimes forced us to return to who we are. We shouldn't have to have Neville Longbottom killing the Death Eaters in Baltimore, but sometimes the law has to play that role. But we can all be that person, the champion at Hogwarts. Anybody can be that person to slay the forces that would have darkness that would take us away from the rule of law. It's a, it's a it's a sacred opportunity. It's not an obligation. And and it makes your job, even on the worst days, it gives you perspective on why you're doing it. Great. Great words of wisdom. So so I've got two or three Twitter questions here for you. This is the first one is from Leslie Bell from the University of Akron. She says, Hey Peter, can I how can campus and local law enforcement work effectively in combating sexual assault on campus? Oh, well, I love that question. Hey, Leslie, and uh, my wife's from Akron, so we get up there quite a bit. Love the place. It's a great town. But I, I'll get to your actual question. I, they call me ADD Pete for a reason, easily distracted. Um, the government thinks that we should form MOUs, Memoranda of Understanding, with local law enforcement. That's what we're hearing from OCR. And one of my friends in the business says MOUs are like unicorns. You probably will never see one. They do occasionally come into existence, but... I actually think the real, I don't mean to contradict OCR, but I just, I don't entirely agree with their philosophy on this. I think a lot of law enforcement entities actually don't want formal agreements with us, but what they do want is cultural interchange. They want to understand why we're doing what we're doing and how it can work effectively with what they're doing, how we can mutually support each other. And I'll be honest, most police were not trained to the Title IX mission. So you can't expect the police force to suddenly just take up the mission and get it. They, they really often struggle to understand what the heck's going on with colleges right now and what kind of enforcement mission is this? Like, what is it we're supposed to do? One of the biggest changes is, is police job is to prosecute criminals. So when they see a complainant come in, the first thing they're likely to start doing is building a case against the bad person. But the very philosophy of Title IX is opposite of that in some ways. We're, we must respond to the victim and help that person, and that's not necessarily what the police are there to do. They, it's not been their mission. So it's cultural interchange. I am a big believer in campus community coalitions. I think you should get your cops on campus and go to the cops. I think people should be interning in each other's offices. If you can get a formal agreement, the government will love you. You will become the finder of the unicorn. And you'll probably get a national webinar. Everybody will talk about your name. But the reality is I think there's something much more magic out there. A, a little pony will do just fine for the what you need. You don't need to get the unicorn. Nice. So Kim Bradford from University of Arkansas asks, how does the Clary Act apply to a fully online university? Uh, it still does. It's just different types of crimes may occur. And so I think the problem you run into when you're fully online is that you're looking for guidance from the masters of Clery reporting that are used to the kinds of incidents that are more likely to occur on a physical campus. So you want to look to your peer group for guidance on how to construct Clery reports. And I'm going to step out and editorialize right now. I don't like Clery enforcement the way it's currently done. There's no good faith exception in it. If you make a mistake, they fine you a 35K a mistake and they can aggregate them. So you can have a $100,000 fine even if you're doing your very best. And it puts everybody on edge. I don't think that's necessary. And I think it's particularly true when you have hybrid learning environments or online learning environments. Uh, most of the experts that consult on Clary report composition deal with schools that have a substantial live instructional component, that they're, you know, physical component. So it doesn't mean they don't know what they're talking about. It's just that you're, well, you're not O positive, but you're definitely not the most common blood type. And so, therefore, it's hard to get the kind of instruction you need. So I would imagine that you feel a little on edge about this. I would. I'd do with any Clary report. Um, I don't like the system, but I think the way to do it is look to peer groups for guidance and work with each other on what are you doing? You know, what, what practices are you doing? Because your report will look a little different. Cool. 
So la last question from Twitter, and, and then we'll wrap up. Ray Raymonda Bergman from Higher Education Resource Services, HERS Institute. I, I think what they're asking is, how does bullying, is there a distinction between bullying in real life versus the digi digital world? Um, well, I think bullying is bullying. I think it plays out in the digital world in a particularly pernicious way sometimes, a uh, little different. Uh, the persistence of digital information and the ability to intrude into someone's secluded space is particularly obnoxious. I was bullied a lot as a kid, big surprise, and my bullies were straight out of Christmas story. You know, they would meet you outside the schoolyard and push you around and scare you. Um, today's bullies may show up hack into your computer, start tweeting bad things about you, and I, I don't know which is worse. I mean, I didn't go through that, so I can't say personally which is more harmful. It's the, it's the same kind of behavior. It's just using different tactics and tools, and we have every right to attack bullying with legal and non-legal rules. Um, keep in mind, though, that the Supreme Court has said that there is a right to hate, so Americans have the right to hate, and as you, as you can see, a lot of Americans exercise that right quite openly. Um, you also have the right to express hateful ideas in reasonable time, place, and manner in the proper form. <clears throat> so you can never eliminate hate, at least not through legal principles, but often you can combat it through educational tools. And I think the combination of law and non-legal tools is the right mix in attempting to deal with bullying type phenomenon. Uh, I think if you rely too heavily on one or the other, you probably won't get the most effective interventions. Great. So we're nearing the end of our time here. Can you share with the audience some additional resources that, that you think might help them continue down this, this journey and path of learning? Uh, generally with higher ed law and policy, I, I think what you're seeing is an explosion of a new generation of scholars. The, the first-gen scholars are beginning to retire out. Uh, the, the great leaders of the first generation, we all know the names, you know, Bill Kaplan, Barbara Lee. I mean, I could go on with the parade of the people that created this field, and, and we've all, Judith Arreen, I mean, these are the folks that invented it. Their, their time is beginning to wane. You know, we're getting closer to the end of the careers here, and a new generation of scholars is coming. And what I would do is start trading for some new baseball cards, like look for the, the hot new stars that are rising up, and there are a number of people. I'm always a little averse to naming individuals because the ones I forget to name will email right. me immediately and say, I like, hate you. Like so the Oscars, yeah. Yeah, so we're not going to have a fiasco here, but um, there are ways to become introduced to the rising stars of the field. That You'll see them featured at ACPA events, NASPA events, uh, my conference and others, and I think that's one of the great things is to start getting to know the next generation of scholars. I've met some truly wonderful people out there with great ideas, and they're just about to explode into NBA five ring champions, and you're going to really enjoy it. I, I think, honestly, I think as a, as a herd, I think they run a little faster and stronger than any group of scholars that I've seen, and it's not to knock the previous generation. It's just to say that what we hoped would happen has occurred, that even brighter, more committed in people in a larger number are coming into this field. So this is in an area where things are shrinking. Uh, the economy's been challenged, higher ed's been through a recession. The law and policy side of higher education is expanding rapidly. It's a growth industry. It's kind of fun, and some really cool people are coming into it. So that would be my best thing, is look for people. So, so I mentioned earlier you have, you have this great book out. I, do you have anything up? On, on, in the pipeline, anything coming out soon? We're always putting new stuff together, and in fact, uh, as soon as I'm off today and and we'll get a haircut, um, I'm going back to work on my book on Title IX. I'm doing a primer on Title IX. Excellent. And we should have that finished this summer and probably distributed early sometime in the fall. So that'll be the next thing out. Um, and I think many of you have seen. I don't think this is a book for most people, but Judith Arreen and I did the second edition of her casebook on higher ed law and policy, and it's it's getting a lot of use in the law classrooms and some master's programs. It's a, it's kind of a limited use book for some folks. I wouldn't recommend it broadly, but I'm excited about the Title IX thing. I think it's about time I put pen to paper on that and help people a little bit with Title IX if I can. So look for that. 
Yeah, outstanding. I will look for that. Thank Peter, thank you so much for sharing your time and, and wisdom with us today. I'm going to put together a page called Peter Lakeisms. Um, you've, you've certainly had lots of great gems here today. Well, um, <laughs> you got to have fun with this stuff. I mean, I work with really grim stuff, Tony. I mean, it is. People are being injured. Their rights are being violated. This is serious stuff, and I don't mean to make light of it, but I think what I hope I can inculcate in people that there is a joy of working with the law, that it is possible, that you don't, it isn't drudgery or all negativity, that there's an option. And, and where I always recreate myself is going right back to the fundamentals is why am I here? What's the purpose of this? And the most basic things are to show respect for the rule of law, to pass that on to others, and to show people where the, the goodness of the law exists, even if there's so much badness, there's so much good too, and how we can, can see that. I take a lot of inspiration from Bobby Kennedy and I would hope that you find your own personal guru in this and, and find inspiration for them, whoever you are out there. And if it's not me, whoever it is, that's what I'd like to see people find. So thank you so much, Tony. It's wonderful being on your show. Thank you. And I look forward to possibly seeing you again sometime down the road. So yeah. thanks, everybody. All right. So, uh, folks, before we leave, Heather will be back on May 11th for a conversation about the book Generation Z Goes to College with book's co-authors, Dr. Corey C. Miller and Megan Grace. I'll be back in May 18th to speak with the always brilliant and dynamic Gavin Henning and Darby Roberts, Roberts about their two latest books on student affairs assessment. You can receive reminders about this and other great shows by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. You can also browse the archives at higheredlive.com or subscribe to our iTunes podcast and listen in as you travel to and from work. I'm Tony Duty. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you make it a great week, and I look forward to seeing you soon.